Welcome to the Theta Oil Field Services Road Pumping Optimization video podcast. This is John Zvinos. The following podcast is a presentation given at the 2009 Southwest Petroleum Short Course in Lubbock, Texas. I'm Andy Cordova. I'm with Lufkin Automation out of the Houston office, and uh, we're going to talk about the control side of beam pumping now. We love acronyms and good old oil field. We talk about pump off control. We've started to call it rod pump control because we have pump off in ESPs, PCPs and such. So we're trying to define it a little bit more. So this talk is going to really be about what do we do on a beam pumping unit to try to control it to match your reservoir. And if you look at what's out there in the market, there's a lot more beam pumps than anything else. I think that's why you see a lot more schools, you see a lot more products. There's a lot better defined software for analysis and design. Just a, a lot of tools available since there's so much of that in the market. But some of the other industries are growing as well and they're starting to really get a lot more tools available for you to do more things to optimize your wells. I always like to throw this in here because most people are in some type of enhanced recovery, water flood or such. So when we're talking about beam pump, don't forget about your injection wells. If that guy's down the hall, check with him and see if he's making some changes in those injection wells because it's going to affect your beam pump wells. And try to communicate and work with those guys. As you saw earlier from Jim's presentation, there's lots of different geometry pumping units and there's controllers for all different types. It just creates a little bit different challenges for what you have to install at the well. But uh, all of these can be controlled in one means or another. And we could even control that one if they'd want to run it again. This is out by uh, Taft, California and it's still sitting there. Um, I'm not too sure what type of wood they used on that beam, but it's still not rotted. So what are we really talking about when we want to control a well? Well, most of you designed your unit to get every bit of fluid out of that well you can. Most likely, more than what you can. So now you're going to have a situation called fluid pound to where there's not complete fillage of the pump. So when you're going in the downstroke, the pump will just go through a gassy column before it hits the fluid. So you remember diving off the side of the pool? Not too bad. Get up on the high dive, jump off. Does it feel a little bit different when you hit that fluid in the water? Yes, it does. Rod string feels the same thing. Now, I've got a high dollar demo here that Lynn always wants to steal from me, but rod string is just a slinky, guys. It's the same type of setup, so that that rod string, you're either going to have under travel or over travel at the pump. Just because we got 100 inches at the surface, it doesn't mean we have 100 inches at the pump. But when we do see that fluid, it pushes up and compresses the rod string on the way down. And this is what we're looking at in a dynamometer cart. So really, a rod pump controller is trying to match your pumping system to that reservoir. And how we do it is just simply when we don't see fluid in the pump, we stop the well for a while. Give it a time for the reservoir to bring fluid in and it builds up in your annulus. But at some point, you're going to start holding back pressure. And you need to pump that off or more fluid will not come in. So there's two features of a controller. It's running and then when it stops for pump off, you have to decide how long to leave it off. That's a real critical number. You leave it off too long, you're going to lose production. You don't leave it off long enough when it starts back up, it's still going to be in a fluid pound condition. There will not be enough fluid there to fill the pump. But what's bad is happening here when we see fluid pound it is the buckling of the rods. So we're going to cause pump damage, we're going to cause rod damage, we're going to cause tubing damage. That's the highest failure rates that we see from over pumping wells. And uh, what Jim said is correct. We're seeing a lot more overseas where they do not want to pump the wells off. They're leaving a thousand foot of fluid sometimes. So we have to look at different methods over there to try to control to leave the higher fluid levels. One thing that we try to promote is before you do anything, you really should try to optimize your wells. Run a fluid level, run a dynamometer. Try to get your system matched to that reservoir as best as you can. 
You can change strokes, length, stroke size, uh, go through these type things, and when you really want to start spending money, moving pumping units around. We do a lot of that where you right size. Uh, move the big pumping unit to the well that you really need it in to save the money instead of buying another big one. But finally you get to a point that you have no choice but to install a controller. Now a lot of people just start off with controllers. And uh, it's a cheap way to putting it on your drilling AFE. Uh, we have a lot of people that put a controller on a well and it band-aid some of their problems. They got a bad design, but they're trying to solve it with the controller. How many use time clocks? A few? When was the last time you reset your time clock? That's the problem with time clocks. Great tool. But you've got condition changes. Pump's wearing. Is the reservoir changing? I um, like to ask a lot of people, what's their uh, rule if they lose power? If you've lost power for an hour, half a day, do you go turn the well on hand, try to pump it back down, then you do you flip it back to time clock? You know, you need to keep up with your time clocks. They're a great tool. Just, just make sure you keep up with them to make sure they're matching the well. If you have a dynamometer, it's a great tool to be able to put your dynamometer on the well and watch the cycle of the time clock to see, does it run till it pumps off? Then do I leave it down long enough when it comes back on? Is the card full? Is it running nice? For a standard controller, these are numbers that have been put together for years. The, the main first big project was Shell out here at Denver City, which is now a, an oxy operation. And what they saw versus what they were doing normally was a 20% reduction in power. So that just showed them that they were over pumping. They were pumping too long, just wasting power. So they matched the reservoir with the controller, saved about 20% in power. The other thing they saw was rod, pump, tubing problems, pulling units. I'm amazed when I hear some of the prices of what some people are spending. I was told the other day in some of these wells out here, when the well goes down, it's costing them $35,000 to pull that well and get it back online. That's pretty astronomical. Uh, hopefully some are less. You're grinning. Do you get one higher than that? <laughs> so when you look at, you know, typical controllers are less than, you know, $5,000 installed, so it's, it's a pretty good insurance policy of trying to extend that life. Um, the other is the production increase. Now, most of you are running your wells to get all the fluid you can. You put a controller on there, is it going to get you more fluid? Most likely not, unless you were not running the well properly. Uh, where we usually get you more fluid is we're not having the downtime days. We're taking out the days that you were having the failures, and that's really where the production increase comes in. We did a project over in Germany that we tripled their production, and it was amazing until we saw what they did. They came in in the morning, turned their well on, and when they went home in the afternoon, they turned the well off. So two-thirds of the day, the well did not run. So it wasn't very difficult for us to cycle that well and just get them more production. They were amazed, but uh, we shouldn't get a lot of credit for it, but they did buy a lot of controllers because of that. Here's uh, during our good Enron days. This was a project in California that they put the controllers on in January. And I remember when the guy called me and said, man, this is really neat. We, we reduced our power, but we didn't save any money. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, our rate went up so high that even at a 40% reduction in power, our bill stayed the same. So if we wouldn't have put these controllers on, our bill would have been 40% higher. But it just shows that your run times can go down by matching that reservoir with a controller. Uh, 